the son of Nosis, or Shams al-Marif, by Ahmad al-Buni. Welcome. Welcome to you. I've just listened uh, to a vlog on what magic is this on the Shams al-Marif, or the son of Gnosis, by Ahmad al-Buni, uh, which is absolutely excellent. Indeed, I have to say that What Magic Is This is one, one of my favourite channels on YouTube. And the vlog is an interview with Amina Inoles and Jay Hamaid, who have partially translated the book into English. And I, I just wanted to share some of it with you, basically. I have to warn you that my own Arabic is very limited. And therefore, this is very much outside my immediate area of expertise. Indeed, whilst many people in Indonesia can read and understand some classical Arabic, their knowledge is often somewhat rudimentary. And therefore, even where it does influence magic in Indonesia, I suspect it will be misinterpreted in many places. In fact, I strongly suspect that much that comes from Shams al-Marif was being passed down over the ages from early Sufi merchants to Indonesia, a rather than a direct interpretation of the book itself, although I am not discounting that that does happen. Who was Ahmad al-Buni? Well, he was known as Sharaf al-Din, or, or Shiba al-Din, or Minya al-Din, Abul al-Abbas Ahmad ibn Ali ibn Yusuf al qureshi al-Sufi. Um, but yeah, he's more commonly known as Ahmad al-Buni. And it's believed he was probably born in Buna, in pres present-day Anaba, in Algeria. And he died somewhere around about 1225. He was an Arab mathematician, philosopher, as well as a well-known Sufi and writer on mm. esoteric values of, of um, letters and topics relating to mathematics. Should I say the word sheer sorcery? Maybe, maybe magic, spirituality. But actually very little known is about him. He did leave, uh, live in Egypt, which is where he died. And there he learned from many eminent Sufi masters. It's unlikely that he's the author of all that's contained in Shams al-Marif. And many people would simply have used his name to promote their own writings, which is then been incorporated into the body of evidence that we believe is by him and you may find that strange but it was a common practice not just in the Arab world but uh, across the world at the time. Now the magic sorry magic squares the first few chapters of Shams al-Marif Marif, introduce the reader to the idea of magic squares the combination of numbers and the alphabet that are believed to bring magical effects now, you may have come across these in mathematics because it's an, an array of numbers, <coughs> <coughs> usually positive inter integers. And indeed, it's called a magical square if the sum of the numbers in each row, each column, and both diagonals are the same. The order of the magic square is the number of in integers along one side. And the constant sum is called the magic constant. Ahmad al Buni shows how to construct these magic squares using simple bordering techniques. But it's unlikely that it was he who discovered this method himself. So much of the book is believed to be a collection of things that already existed. Al Buni wrote about Latin squares and constructed, for example, four by four Latin squares using letters from one of the 99 names of Allah. 
they're seen as being a code for the universe, for unlocking the 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 marvels of the universe. Um, in writing the name of Allah, um, although some might argue they're used for summoning jinn, spirits, and angels, but certainly in the book itself, you know, some are definitely some of the squares are used for summoning jinn, but in the main, they're the names of Allah. Indeed, words, especially when spoken, are believed to hold the key to accessing the universe. Now, I see it as if you like <coughs> a 2D matrix. Well, in fact, it is a 2D matrix, isn't it? But of course, if we go up into other dimensions, and I purposely didn't say three dimensions there because maybe we can go to many dimensions, constructing these matrices of numbers and possibly of letters, then we're talking about crystals. And indeed, some physicists are currently experimenting with this very concept of crystals, crystalline structures and the numbers contained within them to unlock the secrets of the universe. Now, it's been suggested that these magic squares were known about in pre-Islamic times. Uh, but the study of the magic squares was most common in medieval Islam, uh, despite those of Wahhabist persuasion completely refuting this. The first debatable appearance of a magic square of an order of three contains it, is contained in Jibir Ibn Hayyan's Kitab al-Mazin al sagir the Book of Balances, um, and, well, he lived from 721 to 815, so it's not really, no, it's somewhere around there when it was where it's, uh, written, where the magic square, where he introduces magic squares, and it's, in, it's related to numerology and associated with alchemy. Uh, whilst... There was a treatise on magic squares written in the 9th century. The earliest really exact treatise were from the 10th century, one by Abul Wafa Bujani, circa 998, and another by Ali, or Ahmad al-Akti, circa uh, 987. And these were purely mathematical. And the Arabic Arabic designation for magic squares used in Wafak al Adad, which translates to the harmonious disposition of the numbers. However, by the end of the 10th century, the two treaties by Buzani and Antaki make it clear that the Middle Eastern mathematicians had understood how to construct bordered squares of any order, as well as simple magic squares of small order, so i.e. Lesson, lesson 6, which were used to make composite magic squares. Ahmad al-Buni attributed the, the mystical properties to magic squares, a series of magic squares from order 3 to 9, but there's also references to the use of magic squares in astrological calculations, a practice which probably did originate with the Arabs. In many parts of the Arab world, magic squares would be the main form of magic used, especially as, as many Arabs see the evil eye as haram, i.e. forbidden, uh, but not magic. Wafak or Tawis. Now, in Indonesia, we have two main groups of objects which tend to be used for magical protection, uh, but also for casting of spells. And these are Jimat and Wafak. Uh, they don't directly correspond to amulets and talismans, but Jimat are more likely to be worn or contained on the person, whereas Wafak are more likely to be placed around the home 
and that would be particularly above entrances, so above and around doors and windows. No, the main distinction is that Wafak contain magical squares. In Indonesia, these are often called Solomonic squares or Sulaymanic squares. Although the term, another term used in the West is squares of Saturn. Although most Indonesian Muslims um, somewhat recognise that they come from a Sufi tradition, uh, these Wafak tend to originate in Bantan and Banjar, which is in Kalimantan. Although, quite honestly, they could be copied anywhere within central Western Indonesia. Uh, when I've attempted to translate them, they do indeed appear to contain the names of Allah. Uh, but certainly within Indonesia, even a slightly different spelling of that name is purported to completely change the meaning. And so therefore could be malicious. But I believe in general, in general, the, these, these Wafak do contain one of the 99 names for Allah. Well, I really hope you've enjoyed this vlog and that, yeah, not only got something out of it, but provoked thoughts. I'm not here to push my beliefs, my thoughts on you, only to open up your own thinking, get you thinking about the world and life. When I started The Real Magic of Java, I believed that I'd only release them every month or, or maybe every two months. Uh, but now I find myself adding to this, this subsection once or twice a week. Uh, but please subscribe and hit the bell to get notifications for when I add new parts to this subsection. In part, the reason why I'm doing it more often is that the concept has moved from filming rituals and events that took place in Java to me also describing my beliefs and philosophy. And, and that does come in response to people expressing an interest in it. But of course, you know, me actually seeing rituals and events uh, really doesn't happen so often. What I would say to you is that there's no attempt at subterfuge on my behalf. And when I do experience rituals, I will include them for you to see. And as I say, there's, there's no way I'm trying to mislead you. And if, if I believe there is subterfuge, uh, if I uncover it, I will point it out to you. I'm trying to be as honest as I can be. Now, please make comments. Please ask questions. And I'll try to be as, as honest and open with you as I can be. Of course, there will be some of you who disagree with me, particularly when I talk in terms, to, terms of my own beliefs, my own feelings. And, you know, you're welcome to alternative feelings and we can agree to disagree. Um, sometimes I find that people on YouTube can be unnecessarily attacking and aggressive and at times, I don't restrain myself enough, and I apologise, but it's not my intention to put anybody down, you know. I, I know what I talk about can be emotive, um, and it, it can be challenging, challenging to your beliefs. Um, but, you know, I, I'd love to enter an open discussion, a heartfelt discussion, but unfortunately, I, I often come across things that are... Oh, especially when people quote the scriptures to me. I, I, I've just no idea where it takes us, you know. Because I'm speaking from the heart, you know. I mean, you know, sorry, sorry. If you want to quote the scriptures, I mean, do so. But it doesn't have much impact on me, you know. I personally have no desire to impose my feelings on you. And I suppose when people try to do it to me, I, you know, it, it, well, it washes off, you know. All I'm trying to do is I, I, I'm trying to share my feelings with you. And I'd love, I'd love an open discussion on feelings. I really would. 
I really would love it, you know, and, and sorry, sorry if I don't always react as, as best I should. I, I try and cure this in myself, but I think this is part of the sort of narcissism of social media that I talk about so much in this subsection. So look, if you've enjoyed it, I really urge you to listen to other sections on this channel, particularly the four audio books that I've uploaded onto this channel. Yes, they are in a novel format. They are novels. But they go into much greater depth than my thoughts and feelings. Now, what I would say to you is these are sequential. So my thoughts and feelings develop as we go through each chapter and each book. So it does begin with 1.1, the Chinese cemetery. But, you know, hey, it's up to you. Feel free to dip in as, as you wish, as you want. And, you know, really heartfelt thanks for listening to this. And I really want to say a great big thank you. And God bless you.